Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to uh, this online webinar, uh, Climate Diplomacy Designed to Deliver. This is an event um, which we're delighted to organise uh, from the European Council on Foreign Relations. My name is Susie Dennison, and I lead the European Power Programme at ECFR. I'm um, really looking forward to the discussion this afternoon around climate diplomacy um, with Anna Strauska, um, who is um, head of um, unit for the um, Green Transition um, at the European External Action Service, and Metz Engstrom, who is um, my colleague at ECFR, a senior fellow, uh, with whom we have just published a paper today, uh, Decarbonisation Nations, which we're looking forward to talking more about. So I'm just going to kick off um, with a couple of comments about why we've um, uh, brought this discussion together today, um, and um, then we're going to uh, hear from, from the speakers. Essentially, um, uh, on the, the EU has, um, as a very clear part of its identity, um, for many decades, been a very active climate power. Um, and it's been, I think, reasonably successful at this uh, through uh, a period uh, of, of, of certainly change um, uh, on the international agenda, um, but, in, uh, but, but a period over the last few decades through which there was a logic of cooperation around the global um, challenges on, on climate. Um, through the last uh, um, decade since um, the launch of the UNFCC process, uh, we've seen this, this process of uh, cooperation functioning relatively effectively through the turbulence of wars, um, through uh, different changes in power dynamics internationally, and through changes of uh, government um, in, in various global powers. Um, and, and I think that sort of through this experience, um, uh, the EU sort of be became quite synonymous with, um, with climate power, with the idea of green leadership, um, and uh, certainly uh, with the launch of the European uh, Green Deal, it became the only major global actor with a clear plan about how it was going to take forward whole of economy decarbonisation. However, we've seen major shifts in the last few years, which I don't think will be news to anybody joining the discussion this afternoon. Um, we've seen Russia's war in Ukraine and uh, the Western response to that um, with um, uh, successive rounds of quite strong sanction packages, um, and also the, um, the perceived necessity of decoupling um, from depend energy dependence on Russia and making um, a series of um, uh, uh, strategic decisions about the EU's energy sources, um, which have led to a questioning uh, in uh, the global south. Uh, about the extent to which there are double standards from an EU point of view, uh, that, uh, that, that Europe uh, was um, focused on securing an energy from any source um, and, uh, uh, and continuing uh, to, to depend through this transition period on, um, on fossil fuels um, uh, and gas in particular, um, but um, at the same time um, was phasing out investment um, in gas uh, in, uh, in, in, in African states and, and other parts of the global south. Um, I think another major development um, uh, which has been growing uh, in recent years is a perceived uh, um, lack of sufficient investment, and I think this is jointly shared in the views of um, countries in the global south, um, between Europe and the US, um, a perceived insufficiency of, um, of serious climate investment. And um, after at COP27, uh, the, the, the loss and damage fund um, mechanism idea was, was adopted, um, there remains uh, major questions about sort of where the finance is going to come from and whether that's going to be at, at sufficient scale. Um, so I think this has also contributed to uh, a loss of goodwill uh, around understanding of, um, of, of the EU as, 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 as a green leader. The, uh, I think the third um, major development, uh, which is, has changed the, the current context, is that um, the, in, with the introduction of the Inflation Reduction Act, the US, um, and I think this was very welcome uh, on all sides, came back to the table in terms of climate leadership. But at the same time, that introduced a new model um, uh, uh, to um, the, 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 the nature of um, uh, transformation uh, of, of, of the economy um, to, to decarbonize, um, in particular, adding massive subsidization to the sort of um, uh, model which uh, the European Green Deal had set out with, um, which was based largely around regulation um, and carbon pricing and less of a focus there. 
So this has also introduced um, quite a lot of nervousness, um, particularly among European businesses, about what this does to our um, ability to compete in the current envir environment. And finally, from a public opinion point of view, uh, European leaders now um, uh, are, are, are faced with um, uh, European public um, who are very scared, um, both for hard security concerns with war in Europe um, and, um, uh, and, and all of the consequences and, and, and fears that, that that entails, but also very scared economically, having been through um, the economic roller coaster of, of COVID, ruptures in supply chains, um, and the fallout um, from that, um, and, and now the consequences of the decisions that we've taken on the sanctions packages um, on Russia um, and the, yeah, the re repercussions um, uh, of those measures uh, being felt in Europe as well as globally. So um, European leaders, I think, are in a hard place to sell the necessity of climate action and particularly climate investments uh, in this environment. And yet, despite these kind of four um, different challenges that I've described, and, and I think there are many more um, changes in the geopolitical picture that we could draw attention to, um, climate remains absolutely central to the type of uh, global actor that the European Union aspires to be. Um, and so um, uh, at the, with, with this backdrop, we wanted to explore the question um, this afternoon of how European climate diplomacy can adapt. Uh, Max and I have been leading a project uh, at ECFR to, um, to try to unpack this. Clearly, the economic security pa paradigm is very important uh, in, in Europe at the moment. Um, and we wanted to think about how we could bring climate more centrally into that picture um, and, and look both at the structures uh, of climate diplomacy and the, the sort of the narrative, if you like, around climate di diplomacy that would um, ensure that uh, the two uh, objectives were mutually reinforcing. We have focused particularly in our project on Europe's relationship with African states because um, the Afri African countries are obviously key not only to the external dimension of the European Green Deal, but also to Europe's ability to drive this forward um, uh, and, and ensure the, uh, the, um, the supplies, the tech, um, also the energy sources, which um, it, it needs to implement change uh, within European countries. We've, we've run a dialogue series with policymakers um, and thinkers and analysts, trying exploring different aspects of this question around energy, industrial development, and so on. And we've um, brought our thinking um, from that process and from broader research together in, in, in the paper, which I mentioned, which we've published today. Um, and but um, what we wanted to do this afternoon is really unpack that picture um, uh, with uh, with with Anna Strauska um, and um, and with you collectively in the Q and A session afterwards, and get comments, reactions uh, on on how this can be taken forward. So, with that introduction, I would like to give the floor, if I may, to to you, Anna, um, to to get your sense of of, of how you're working on this um, for, for from an EU perspective. Um, and how you're trying to drive climate diplomacy forward in this environment. Thank you very much, Susie. I hope you can hear me well. Yes, thanks a lot. Good afternoon to all. Uh, very, very warm welcome. And thanks a lot for inviting, inviting me to this um, inspiring uh, session. So uh, first of all, um, let me just say uh, a word of introduction. Uh, my name is Anna Stroska. I'm head of the Green Transition Division or unit uh, in the European External Action Service. And uh, I realized that the institutional system in Brussels is quite complex. So just to, to, to say that the European External Action Service is a diplomatic arm of the European Union. And we are uh, quite a young department, which, which uh, works with the Commission very closely with the member states, of course. And we, we have been here only for the not even two years, a fully fledged department working on the green transition. So that, I think that gives you a sense of the fact that this is a new priority, but it's definitely a priority since we have a fully fledged department. It's still too, too little, of course, for, to cover all the challenges, but we have to cope and we, we work very closely with all the other act actors. So that is uh, important. 
And um, I think what we uh, also would like to emphasize is that uh, the key actors in our uh, work on climate diplomacy, apart from the Commission and the member states, are also our delegations. Delegations is the diplomatic missions of the European Union abroad. And we are very lucky to have a very broad network of these missions, uh, around 140, so in most places of the planet. And, and this is also one area where we try to make sure this is clearly a priority for the work. But, uh, and, and Susie, you've uh, raised a number of very actually topical issues. And uh, the last one is particularly relevant for us, the structures and how we work on that. I'll come back to this, but if you agree, I will start with a bit of a broader picture to say why we need the climate diplomacy or rather green diplomacy, I would actually argue. So um, starting from that point, uh, we try to always say green diplomacy because uh, climate diplomacy is a little bit sort of um, too narrow, we would find. Uh, now we, we uh, see more and more uh, aspects that are linked to the, of course, energy, but also environmental, environmental challenges, deforestation, water. So, um, you know, we, we rather prefer to say green diplomacy and we look through this broader um, perspective. So first of all, um, I think it's very, very clear now and I hope it's clear also for our audience that uh, the green transition uh, is now really a central priority for the European Union. And it is also uh, now a priority for our external relations, a priority for our foreign policy which has no, not been the case a couple of years ago. And of course, there are many reasons for that. So first of all, it's clear that the climate challenges have only increased. We see that the global slowdown from the COVID-19 has not curbed the emissions, on the contrary. And with the, of course, impact of the Russian aggression against Ukraine, we see additional challenges. We see also the bad trends on coal and related emissions and many other aspects that are of course very very uh, incompatible with the uh, Paris agreement targets. We see also uh, on the other hand that there is more and more urgency felt by the citizens so this is a bit more on the positive side that the climate has now uh, is no longer a niche. We see there is a growing awareness and there is of course also a growing pressure from the citizens on the decision makers to address the challenges related to the climate change and then the green transition. And that we see not only in Europe, but also in the other parts of the world. So that is helpful. Now, um, as you said, Susie, uh, European Union is clearly, clearly um, a leader, uh, the, 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 the actor that is very, very much ambitious on its climate goals, both domestically and internationally. And we indeed lead by example. We have the Green Deal. We have also all our targets enshrined in law. So we have dedicated climate law and we have the targets that lead to a neutral no, climate neutrality in 2050. Now it's, it's all good and we've been working very hard to adopt the legislation packages to make sure that we are fully on track with our commitments and yet we are only eight percent of the global emissions and decreasing so whatever we do in europe as much as hard as we work we will never be able to address alone uh, the, the 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 climate uh, and green transition um, uh, challenges and here is why we have to work very very closely with the entire uh, community globally with all the uh, countries and partners around the world. We are also uh, the, the biggest donor on climate finance worldwide. Uh, we, together with the EIB and the European member states, we are the leader, the biggest contributor of public climate finance. And we've been uh, doing more and more, we've been increasing that part uh, in our recent uh, multiannual financial framework. Now, uh, how we work? Actually, we work through different channels and ways, uh, but just to give a bit of a, a framework. So first, first of all, you have the multilateral 
uh, negotiations, uh, the UNFCCC, and that's one way of uh, of uh, promoting uh, the green transition globally. Now, um, I think we can be quite frank and say that there are uh, sort of limitations of these uh, multilateral processes as quite often um, what we can end up with is the sort of common lowest denominator. And when we look back at the last two COPs, uh, well, in Glasgow, I think we've achieved quite a lot of progress. We had an ambition, ambitious work program on mitigation, phasing down of coal and phase out of fossil fuel subsidies, commitments, the launch of the Global Methane Pledge, the launch of the first Just Energy Transition Partnership with South Africa that was led by the European Union, also the statement of the multi-annual de multilateral development banks that they want to increase their climate finance, and also lots of other commitments and pledges from different countries. Now, when we look at the COP27, um, from our point of view, I mean, the African COP, uh, the, from our point of view, we could have done better. Of course, one of the important elements is the agreement on the loss and damage and that we want to do more on that. That's very clear. And that's where we want to work closer with our uh, partners from the Global South, from the developing countries. But we think that on mitigation, we could have achieved much more. And actually, as long as the mitigation as emissions are not addressed, there will be always more and more to be addressed on the adaptation and loss and damage front. So this is still something that is very, very uh, high on our agenda and very close to our heart. Now we have hopes for this COP. COP28 in Sharm el Sheikh, we, we count on the uh, UAA presidency that uh, in this uh, first global stock take, um, this will be really um, addressed in as serious manner as it should be. But I mean, uh, just to make sure that it's very well understood, while we really care about loss and damage and adaptation, mitigation is the issue that is then uh, causing the, the other um, the other um, crisis. Now on uh, climate finance, uh, as I said, we are the leader yet, you know, uh, to be very honest, uh, there is a limit to what the public finance can bring. And we need definitely new innovative ways of funding. We need the reform of the MDBs. And uh, we also have high hopes for the upcoming um, uh, summit in Paris in June, and we can work there uh, very closely with our partners from around the world to address the issue of funding. So that is the more of a multilateral track. Then we have also the dedicated uh, plurilateral tracks, because we also try to address um, the challenges uh, with through a coalition of the willing, if we can say so, of a different uh, group of countries. So we have the Just Energy Transition Partnership, for example, with South Africa that was launched in, um, in, um, in Glasgow. And um, we hope it will then continue to be, to, it, the, the implementation will be able to start pretty soon. We are working on another Just Energy Transition Partnership with Vietnam, also with Senegal, and we consider some other uh, partners potentially for this type of cooperation. Another example is the Global Methane Pledge. So that was also uh, the joint EU and US initiative launched in uh, Glasgow. And we are very proud to have now 150 countries gathered around that with a global target of uh, cutting the methane emissions by 30% by 2030. So this is something very uh, concrete very specific, which really can help change the course of action and which is um, com which is um, which 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 is uh, coherent with all the commitments, but it's a very, very, you know, concrete action um, undertaken. And then we have, of course, a number of different types of dialogues uh, and and partnerships with different uh, partners around the world. Uh, we have the green alliances, green uh, partnerships, 
now also with the um, uh, impact of the uh, Russian aggression against Ukraine and the diversification of our energy sources, we have concluded a number of memorandum of understandings of, on the energy. So it's essentially to diversify our energy sources and also to work with the partners on the green transition and the carbonization of energy. Now, uh, from the AIS perspective, from the foreign minister's perspective, uh, I would like to also underline that um, green transition is a subject which is increasingly present at the discussions of the foreign ministers in the EU framework. So we have, I think uh, last year we had the record four or five times when we addressed the climate or green uh, issues during that discussions. Um, and this is something which is very different from where we, st where we stood a couple of years ago. So there is a clear trend. We have also a yearly council conclusions. So it's a sort of a common narrative of all member states and the European Union which provides the framework for our climate diplomacy and also gives the, the direction of the travel for the, for, the, for the coming year. So just to give you a, a gist of the key messages from this year, Council conclusions, uh, just to you know the key messages are that, first of all, the EU does not allow Russia to use energy as a weapon. Then the fact that EU stays the course I mean, it was mentioned that uh, some, uh, some um, doubted that with the uh, diversification of our energy sources, now we will stay on track. On the contrary, we have accelerated our green transition. Then the next message is that we are also very eager to stepping up the cooperation on green transition with partners. The green transition is not just the EU internal objective, but we want to work on this with the partners worldwide. Then the message that I mentioned that we are still the biggest and the most reliable partner on finance and cooperation. We also called for the reform of the multilateral development banks and IFIs to align that better with the Paris Agreement objectives. The climate and security dimension, the climate change as a multiplier of risks and how we can address that. And the last but not least and very important trend of work uh, is the strengthening of our green diplomacy together with the uh, member states. And this is actually the strand, a uh, very, very practical strand on which we work with the member states right now. And which we hopefully, um, which will hopefully help us to strengthen our uh, green uh, diplomacy. So maybe just as a last um, couple of uh, points, I will um, give you a, a gist of how we work uh, with the member states also on the green diplomacy. I've seen that you have kindly suggested in your paper that the resources should be increased. And I fully agree. I couldn't agree more. Uh, the only problem is that uh, knowing the institutional and financial um, constraints, this is quite unlikely to happen. Uh, for us, the only way uh, is to get either the free seconded experts from the member states or something on which we actually now focus very much is to just, uh, you know, um, make the best use of available resources. And, 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 and when we discuss with the member states, uh, with the foreign ministers of foreign ministries of member states, we see that they face actually the same issue. So they have quite limited um, uh, human and financial resources to invest in the green diplomacy. Of course, there are some countries uh, which are the bigger ones with bigger networks that have much more resources. There are some other countries which have very few embassies in any case around the world and the resources on green are very, very limited. So um, it, it's, it's, it's very, very different from yeah. one country to the other. Hmm. And uh, to be very, very practical, one way is now to, you know, engage more with the member states, give them more um, sort of uh, information on uh, our um, lines to take, uh, on uh, to, to conduct joint marshes, making sure that we act as uh, Team Europe 
uh, on green diplomacy and not just uh, separately. I'll stop okay. here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for a really comprehensive um, overview of, uh, of of the way that not you're, you're not just thinking about this but working on this. I think I think that's hugely helpful to kick us off. Um, Max, I wonder if I could ask you um, to sort of um, try and react on where you see as the gaps. Um, we've heard from Anna um, uh, the, 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 that there is a lot of focus on, on, on how we build up partnerships. I know this is something that, um, that you've been thinking and working on a lot um, yourself. Um, and uh, I wondered if you also wanted to, to react on some of the structural points um, uh, that, that, that Anna had made in, in terms of your thinking of, about how this can um, potentially go further. Um, so yes, the floor is yours. And I can see that there's already some um, interest coming in the Q&A box. I would encourage you to keep that coming and we'll leave plenty of time for interaction at the end. Max. Thank you very much for that. Um, and thank you, Ms. Straska, for this uh, excellent also presentation. And let me start by saying that uh, uh, we are aware and, and absolutely agree that there has been much progress on EU climate diplomacy and that uh, both you and the next election service, DG Klima member states are doing really a lot. And, and one can really claim also looking at Paris Agreement and, and earlier that the EU, that it is a, in many parts a success story uh, over time, uh, climate as a part of foreign policy. Uh, what we try to say in this report is, uh, as you also mentioned, that the geopolitics have now changed quite a lot and, and also the geoeconomics. And we have a more intense uh, struggle over loyalties, maybe you can say, but also over resources in different parts of the world, including those that are necessary for the green transitions like uh, critical raw materials, green hydrogen and other aspects. So. We have addressed, uh, for example, finance, as you mentioned in earlier reports quite a lot, the multilateral negotiation process. What we try to do here is also to look more on the need for partnerships on green industrial developments, which is something that many of um, uh, Europe's partners in, in the, uh, other parts of the world, what often is called the Global South, are asking for. And, and just to go a little bit further on that, there are many examples in this report. Uh, you referred to the debt P with South Africa, which is to a large extent about energy, but there is also a part there which was important for South Africa and could have been developed further on the industrial transformation, for example, how they now try to go to electric vehicle production and we give examples how the EU can more support that the member states, that kind of industrial development in several African countries through the cooperation on the research and development, um, uh, demonstration projects, better infrastructure, skills developments. We think it's really important to have that kind of offer to the Global South on these green industrial partnerships. It has been done to a large extent on renewable energy, but now is also the time to do more, we think, on, on uh, industry. And that also brings me then to the institutional questions that you asked about, Susie, because, as I said, there is a lot of good things done on climate diplomacy. But if you have this kind of broader approach, linking it to the development uh, in partner countries, there's also a need for more coherence between different parts of the EU institutions in member states and between uh, the EU level and uh, member states in this Team Europe approach. And uh, here it is, for example, about uh, how does the ministries of industry work together with development ministries, with foreign ministries, climate environment ministries to, to forge these kind of broader partnerships around uh, raw materials, sustainable mining, uh, green hydrogen use to, to promote local development. And, here we have, uh, I'll be short here because it's described in the report, but we have some proposals for more coherence, first on the political level. Uh, others, uh, that is also a good idea, have proposed some kind of high level climate envoy. What we discuss here is also to have that as a member of the European Commission, a specific uh, commissioner for international climate relations. We think that would bring more power to, the, to that kind of political coherence. And this also be discussed before because there are many portfolios in the commission and some are perhaps not so big 
but in a geopolitical commission that would be useful to have more commissioners with this kind of international responsibilities and that could also be combined with a stronger coordination function uh, both uh, i mean there is already good cooperation i understand between the external action service and dg clima in the commission but also to bring this coordination to other parts of the commission other director generals that are really important uh, i mentioned uh, industry research and development but also finance for example and other areas but then you can also go uh, into more specifics uh, on the need to have more strategic plans long term for climate diplomacy uh, developed together with the member states and discussed uh, also among foreign ministers you mentioned the council conclusions which are important and really good that they now state that this goes on and takes up the war of ukraine but also on a more operational level, uh, maybe more could be done uh, together with member states on specific countries and, and what are the most important actions there. Uh, and also, when that is perhaps to the, to the highest level of the external action service, to, to ask for more reports from heads of delegations to make sure that there is more staffing uh, for these kind of things, both in Brussels, but also in the delegations and also uh, together with member state presidencies how to work on this in perhaps a specific working group in the uh, council i will not go into all this it's in the report and i'm sure others have views on this as well but i just like to finish by saying that uh, first to agree that that it's wider than climate and we have also said that in earlier reports more clearly perhaps that really a clear link also to air quality water biodiversity and so to fully agree with you on that, uh, but also perhaps to end with the kind of urgency uh, that when one looks at the way, for example, China now is forging alliances in the global south and in this geopolitical climate, we cannot wait on these kind of issues uh, until, uh, for example, the next, next uh, long term budget. It's really even it's this uh, difficult situation with, with the war in Ukraine needing massive resources. There are a lot of things that need to be done. Uh, very rapidly to, to really create these uh, partnerships uh, also on the economic and development side. But I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, um, Max. Um, as ever, both um, uh, uh, both insightful, um, uh, but also very persuasive on 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 the um, on on the changes um, uh, that, um, that 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 you see as necessary. I wondered if we could stay on this um, this point about the kind of the. The structural underpinning for what we will from now on call green diplomacy, because um, we we fully take your uh, your point on that front. We have a question um, in the chat uh, from Leah Pilsner, who's also done a lot of um, uh, very important work around um, around this question too, um, essentially asking um, this 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 software question uh, about the fact that. Um, uh, that while um, the world has been shifting and the and and the um, the kind of the rationale uh, for, um, for for green uh, diplomacy has, if anything, got stronger because it's so sort of closely tied up um, uh, with our, our economic security in, in in a world which is necessarily decarbonizing. We have to be able to compete within that environment. Um, but uh, she, she asked the question about um, uh, what, what will it take for um, to, to create a reformed foreign policy that that um, uh, that actually drives this forward um, as as that drives green diplomacy forward as, as, as part of the bigger diplomatic picture. Um, Matt and I have been thinking about the potential opportunity coming up with um, uh, the European Parliament elections and um, sort of the, the new institutions coming in for system change. But what is your sense from within the system about um, the extent to which uh, there is that conversation um, going that going about the sort of the radical change in the environment in which we're working in? If I may. Should I react? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. yes, please do. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot for your comments and for your questions. Obviously, it's not an easy reply. Um, I think looking back, uh, our green diplomacy has been changing quite a lot. Um, obviously, uh, 
one very important reason is the impact of the Russian aggression against Ukraine. And the very, um, I would say, uh, unprecedented decision to 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 um, give up our dependency on fossil fuels from Russia, and then uh, how we make up for it, the diversification, and all the issues, difficult, sensitive issues that come with that. So um, the compliance of our climate objectives and you know the need to diversify, to look for other partners with the fact that still for some time we need to rely on fossil fuels. So I think that's one big change that we've seen happening. And there, of course, um, what I'd like to insist on is that when you look at the Repower EU strategy, but also when you look at the, in particular, at our energy, uh, external energy strategy, I think what's very clear and what you want to make very clear is that we are not looking only at Europe's interests, but our objective is to work very closely with the partners and the world. It's not just about our energy transition and our energy security, but it's also about their own energy security, their own development, economic development, social development, and we can help them with that. Um, and by the way, with the impact of the Russian aggression against Ukraine, uh, the, the green diploma, the green policy became uh, a security Ooh. policy of the European Union. It's, it has a completely different dimension. So, so that I would stress that first of all, and also um, even if we have the you know um, agreements on fossil fuels, still for some time for the gas. Uh, to uh, make up for the for the for the for the uh, lack of for, for, for what we don't get any longer from Russia, or don't, we don't want to get any longer from Russia. We still do it with the future in mind, in terms of being, you know, future proof, so that we don't create stranded assets that uh, we can then, you know, use it for hydrogen. So this is also the the sort of more sustainable path for the future. I think the economic dimension that you've mentioned is something that is that is emerging recently more with the economic security, with, of course, the, the response to uh, IRA. And all these elements are now being put into place. I think we are still uh, quite um, uh, in the in the reflection phase to see what how will that shape our external relation. And to be very honest with you, I think um, it's important to have this external part more present in that thinking. Because obviously the tendency, that, that's very natural, huh? it's how this works for Europe. So what we are trying to bring as the European External Action Service and also some other external uh, services of the European Commission is to bring that sort of external dimension. And maybe I will make a link um, to the external dimension of the Fit for 55 proposals, or in general, the legislative proposals of the European Union. Uh, this is also one area where whatever we adopt, I mean, be it regulation about uh, stopping the deforestation or the CBAM, clearly there are impacts on the third countries, we are aware on the producers of the third countries, uh, on the companies of the third countries. And this is, of course, something that will become or is becoming already an irritant in our relations. So um, what we are trying to do also, and for me, this is also part of the green diplomacy, is to work very much upstream together with the commission colleagues who work on this, on this regulatory legislative proposals to make sure that the external impacts are addressed from the beginning and then to engage in conversation with our third partners who will be most affected to try to understand what are the expectations, what are the fears, the concerns, how we can help with adjust adjusting adaptation, because at the end of the day, we believe it's in the interest of all of us. It might be a painful transition, but at the end of the day, you know, uh, everybody stands to benefit. It's just how we can help to go through this delicate uh, phase. Uh, 
should I comment on the on your proposals on the Commission? Um, I, um, I, what I wanted to do actually um, was, uh, sorry, did you, you wanted to comment on, on the question about um, the prioritisation of countries for partnerships or? No, no, on the, on the proposal on the members of the Commission. Okay, yes, go ahead. Yeah. Please. I mean, it can be only a purely personal point of view, of course, because we know that the setting will be for the future. Um, from my own perspective, I, I would think that we should avoid, uh, I mean, the, the more we avoid the silos domestic, internal and external, the better. Because we also see it a bit here. It's um, sometimes if you are focused too much on internal or domestic, you, you forget the external impact. And when you, you know, go and meet the partners in the world and come back and work on the internal proposals and then go again and see what's the reaction, for me, and this is the most sort of consolidated, coherent and pragmatic approach. But I mean, of course, uh, we will see. <laughs> Thank you very much um, for, for very candid reflect reflections. Um, Matt, I wondered if I could um, kick over to you a couple of questions that have come up in the discussion um, uh, that I'd, I'd be interested to get your take on. Um, firstly, um, expectations from your side um, of, of the Just Transition um, Fund and the significance of that um, in, in terms of uh, broadening um, uh, out the, um, uh, the, the agenda, um, given that it focuses on all three goals of the Paris Agreement. And then given that I know that you've looked a lot at um, jet peas, um, I wanted to, um, uh, to, to ask for your views um, on, on whether that model is something that we should be looking at. Um, and maybe this is something we can also come back to Anna on if we may, um, uh, in, in, in uh, you know, sort of what should um, uh, the, 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 the criteria be for focusing um, and, and whether that should be open to, um, uh, to all states that, that are interested in engaging that way. Yes, th thank you for that, uh, Susie. Uh, yes, I think the issue about just transition is, of course, uh, very central, both for the internal EU policies and for the international engagement and uh, this uh, uh, now decision uh, in the uh, Climate Convention to have a work program on justice transition is, is very important. And maybe that also illustrates something that we haven't talked about yet, and, and that is that, of course, climate diplomacy is not only the institutions or governments, but to be effective, it is also several social actors, like, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, people engaged for environment, climate, and specifically, or, or development, but to a very large extent, also social partners like the trade unions and, and progressive uh, business leaders. And, and I think uh, this is really something also where uh, talking about these different also uh, uh, institutions or parts of the commission where, for example, DG uh, employment uh, also in this international uh, part and cooperation could perhaps be even more integrated than, than today. So, so uh, uh, that's that's really important and it's important also with the European example to show other parts of the world that we can manage a, a just uh, transition. But, but that also leads me over to the JETP because South Africa and the JETP is a, also a case in point there. First, because uh, if you want to uh, pace out the use of coal in South Africa, it's evidently very much an issue about just transition, what will happen to the communities, to the workers who are now in that uh, business, but also because there, there is part about just transition in the JETP with South Africa. And I think others will look to this and see how is that implemented? How is the money flowing into that? What is happening on the ground? And more widely on the JETPs to, to continue with South Africa, I must say I'm a bit worried for the JETPs. I mean, it was a great effort to do this with South Africa. But then there was the, these um, problems with ESCOM, the, the power company, and accusations of, of um, uh, corruption. Uh, but there are so much potential in South Africa as in other parts of Africa, and also for the cooperation between um, uh, Europe and, and um, Africa, and specifically South Africa. I mentioned this electric vehicle development, but 
if you look also on sustainable mining and these value chains, uh, South Africa as a regional player is really, really important. So I would really hope that the people who have invested in this JP, I mean, with their political energy in, in Europe also continues this now and, and not, don't, yeah, that, that, it, that, that it really makes it a success. And that of course goes also for South African decision makers who have to do this. But it also illustrates that it's not so easy with this yet piece. I mean, uh, now we have Indonesia, we have Vietnam, discussions with Senegal, as Anistraska mentioned, but I understand Senegal is not that easy to, to agree to JTP, and there is a lot of effort going into them. Uh, so I would argue that it's a good thing. Uh, it brings together many actors uh, uh, around the more comprehensive plans, but uh, you need to choose still selectively where to go into them or not. Uh, but at the same time, devote as much energy really to the horizontal issues around the reform of the multilateral development banks, as Ms. Ashko also referred to, and how to make that a more horizontal, better instrument for the risking investments and making these transitions work. So to have these parallel tracks, I think, is important. Thank you very much indeed. I think that um, uh, that sort of widening out um, uh, brings us nicely back to um, some of the um, issues around uh, future COPs. Um, and uh, in your opening comments, Anna, you, you, you talked to us about um, the way that you're work working towards um, COP28. We've got um, uh, a question actually though um, about COP29, which I'd be interested in either of your takes on um, on the um, uh, whether um, whether it's um, something that, um, uh, that that we should welcome um, or um, uh, or to have a, a COP taking place um, in, in in one of the EU member states. I know there's a particular discussion um, about um, Eastern, Central, and Southern Eastern European states um, that that might be. Um, interested in on, on that front, um, or whether that this is this is sort of a, an effective lever um, for uh, green diplomacy more broadly um, to, um, uh, to, to sort of share this out with different regions, um, uh, and, and, and whether there's a particular view that you have on that. So yeah, interested either in Max's take from an analytical point of view or Anna's take from a, an institutional point of view, or a personal point of view, if you'd like to answer it that way. <laughs> Okay, now thanks a lot. Uh, first of all, uh, I, I agree on many points uh, with Mats uh, on the jet piece uh, and the broader framework for, for, for the risk in the investments and in general uh, creating a more favorable framework for the investors to be willing to engage. On the jet piece, uh, I would uh, like to say indeed you are absolutely right, they are not easy. It's a very complicated process. Um, each jet P is different because you have a different partner in front of you and you have different types of concerns uh, and different uh, political sensitivities and different systems, uh, political system, institutional systems. And you know, you cannot compare South Africa with Vietnam or Senegal. So each comes with its own complexities, plus you have around the table a number of partners, so it makes it more, even more complicated. And then um, obviously this touches really the core political interests in many cases. So it's so political. Um, so it's, it's very difficult, I fully agree. What we have uh, sort of um, been very clear about is that what is absolutely fundamental for this jet piece to succeed is the ownership of the country, because it's not going to be something we are, we are, you know, imposing, absolutely not. Otherwise, it will never work. So the country has to be really willing to decarbonize. And it's about coal, essentially. Senegal is a bit different story, but it's essentially about coal. And we are happy to help. But the first condition is that the country needs to really go that way. Uh, on the COP29, uh, yeah, uh, it's for the for the European Eastern European group. And for the moment, uh, we are still looking at the countries who want to present themselves themselves as potential candidates. 
there are some uh, who consider that, including some member states. But I think it's a little bit early still to, to say uh, what will happen. We know also that with the current very complicated geopolitical situation, there might be additional complications in the selection process. So I think this is something that we need to closely uh, look at and, and, and see also what happens in Bonn when there will be this first uh, discussion, uh, meaningful discussion on, on the presidency. May I just come in on, on that uh, issue Please, and, yeah. say that, and say that, uh, I mean, uh, there is, as uh, you mentioned, these uh, complications uh, to be open that, that Russia also is part of this group that is supposed to agree on, on, on the candidate from this regional group in the UN system. But, but I also think it's important to say that it's not only the location, it's also that as the co-presidents you have a really important role as the United Kingdom showed in Glasgow, for, for example, or of course France for the Paris Agreement. So, so if there is not, uh, uh, I mean, there is also the, I understand, if there is not possible to reach an agreement, uh, uh, the COP28 president would, would kind of uh, continue. And I think that would not be perhaps uh, the best uh, way, so, so in my view, the EU should really try to, to support uh, its member states if they seek this uh, candidacy. I, I understand that it's also a question of regional groups in the UN system, but, but uh, I think that is uh, important and I understand there are good uh, um, offers uh, on the way from, from countries, uh, EU member states uh, on that. But may I also just add one thing, uh, concerning the jet peace and what we were talking about, which I find interesting, and that is the relations to Brazil as a test for what we have been talking about now regarding climate diplomacy, because Brazil and also perhaps India, but now with Lula in Brazil, is a kind of also different animal than South Africa or Vietnam or, or, or Senegal. And uh, now many EU member states are I understand discussing different agreements with Brazil that could include climate. And I think this will also be an interesting test case for the coherence of, of climate uh, diplomacy. Indeed, and, um, uh, and, and, and an interesting point um, for cooperation with a partner where there is uh, so much interest at the moment. So, um, yeah. Um, great. Okay. Well, um, I want to, to finish with a question to you both, because I feel that this has been a really um, meaty conversation um, around the many challenges that there are in, um, in bringing together um, the broader green diplomacy, but sort of ranging from um, the, the structural questions um, within the EU to the, to the kind of the, the, the economic moment that we're in, the, the geopolitical moment that we're in. Um, and, um, and I think that that is, um, that is very real. Um, and, and certainly listening to, to Anna in particular talking about the, 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 the way in which this comes together, um, uh, that, that, that point I think is, is very well taken. But I wondered if I could ask, um, ask you both to finish by sort of pointing towards opportunities um, that you see on the horizon. I'm going to force you into um, a sense of, uh, of, of optimism, um, uh, uh, looking, looking forward about um, uh, the, the, the potential um, uh, for some of these things to shift, the potential um, for some of the realities which we've been um, dealing with uh, for, for, for many years on, on the capacity and structural sides um, to, to change, um, whether you do see um, uh, that in, in the current environment at the moment um, within, within Europe or beyond. Maybe I'll go, come first to you, Max because you're used to dealing with my silly um, optimism. <laughs> no, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm all for the optimistic take. I just read also one more study saying that you have to present the, the positive uh, opportunities to, to achieve uh, also public support for climate policy and results. So I'm all for that. Uh, well, I'm thinking when you say that of all this that is happening around the COPs uh, and in particular the greening of the financial system uh, it's a case I have been looking somewhat at, uh, where, where the Secretary General uh, Antonio Guterres uh, uh, brought together and, and was instrumental in bringing together different financial actors to make a pledge in Paris, if I'm not wrong, uh, to, to, to green their financial investments. And, 
and there has been so tremendous uh, uh, change in the financial sector. Then you can talk about that ESG has some problems and so, but in general, you have so many commitments now in the financial sector to look at uh, the, the climate footprint of their investments. And I think that shows that it's not only the negotiating process, it's also the convening power now also leading up to the important summit of the future in 2024 that is important and all this we have talked about not only the institutions but also a wider field of, of uh, social actors and uh, mm. business trade unions i'll stop i that. think that's a really important point that it's sort of becoming more and more part of the dna of um the, the broader european efforts um, yeah. anna a last word from you yes um I would then not talk about the finance because I agree on this with Matt fully. I would then just add another point is that the green transition, I think, brings many opportunities, uh, especially for our developing partners. I mean, they have huge potential on renewables, um, which can be really uh, used. They have, they can now develop it for their own economic growth and social also um, benefits. And, and we are very happy to help, you know, uh, there is lots of commitment uh, from the developed partners to work with the developing countries to, to, to bring that green transition. So I think for us, it's been a, a growth model, a growth example, and I think this can be also uh, even more so for, for, for the global south. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I think that's important and indeed we could have um, uh, perhaps held uh, a whole conversation on uh, on Europe's relationship with any given country, actually, um, because um, the, uh, the, 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 there are major distinctions um, uh, and 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 uh, aspects which 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 make um, the challenge sort of greater or um, or more complex uh, in, in in any of these cases. And that's um, uh, certainly a conversation that it would be interesting uh, to continue in terms of what exactly an effective approach means um, uh, in, in, in these different partnerships. But I, I'd just like to close by saying thank you very much um, to you both for, um, for being so um, generous with your, 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 your time, but also your reflections um, on, on the situation that we find us in and, and, and responding so candidly to, uh, to the questions that we've had both from me and from, from the Q&A. And um, maybe um, to thank everybody who's joined us online as well. And uh, just to, um, to, to highlight again that there is not only um, on the ECFR website, you today, the report that we've been talking about, um, uh, decarbonisation nations, um, but we've also got two other pieces of work uh, which may be of interest um, uh, related to the broader energy picture. Um, uh, a paper from my uh, colleagues, Shimon Kardash, which is looking at um, the way in which uh, the energy policies, um, export policies of many of the supplier countries for the EU have been evolving since Russia's invasion in Ukraine. And an update for, of our um, energy deals tracker, excuse me, um, which looks at the deals which um, EU member states um, and um, EU collectively is making with third countries um, around its energy picture and the longer term structural implications of those and uh, the elements around clean energy. So um, uh, without further ado, I will close for the, um, for the afternoon and wish you all a good evening. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you.